When you look up at the sky to watch the moon, it may appear to your eyes that you are seeing the same face of the moon always throughout your life from day to day. But if you were to take a telescope and look a little closer at how things changed every day, you would notice that in fact, the moon does not stay still, does not only show you one face, but it in fact wobbles over the course of a lunar cycle. And this wobble is what we're gonna try and capture in this video. It's called the lunar libration. So the big question is, why does the moon appear to wobble from our point of view and not just stay the same? The wobble of the moon can be broken down into three main types. There is the optical libration of the moon, the diurnal parallax libration, and the third type of libration is the true physical libration of the moon. But let's go ahead and break down those three types of lunar libration and explain how they occur. So the vast majority of the libration that we perceive here on Earth is from optical libration. And this is an effect of the combined fixed rate of the moon's rotation along with its elliptical orbit. If the moon orbited the Earth in a perfect circle, then we would never perceive any kind of libration. We would always see the same face pointed towards us because the moon would always be moving at the same speed around us. However, this isn't what we see in reality. In reality, the moon orbits the Earth in an ellipse, where at one point it's closest and one point it's furthest away. We call these the perigee and the apogee, respectively. When the moon is at its perigee, it's moving its fastest relative to us. And when it's at its apogee, it's moving at its lowest relative to us. We also must consider that the moon is rotating. You may not see a rotation because it's tidally locked to our surface. This means we always see one side of the moon because its rotation rate matches the period of its orbit. So as it rotates around us, it's also rotating about its own axis, maintaining a fixed view with the Earth's surface. Now, the rate of rotation of the moon is very steady. And this combined with the fact that the speed changes is how we perceive the longitudinal optical libration of the moon. Now I know that's a lot of fancy words, but it actually boils down to a relatively simple concept. Essentially, when the moon is going its fastest or its closest to us, we see a little more of the right side of the moon. And when it's its furthest from us, we see a little bit more of the left side of the moon. Now this side to side longitudinal libration of the moon is the largest portion of the libration we see and it goes up to about seven and a half degrees that we can see around the edges of the moon. The second portion of the optical libration is the up and down libration, or what we call the latitudinal libration of the moon. And this arises from the inclination of the moon's orbit, along with the moon's own axial tilt, which I haven't modeled here in the animation because it's relatively minor, the majority of this libration coming from the moon's inclination of about five-ish degrees. Now this inclination of the moon's orbit leads to about six and a half degrees of latitudinal or up-down libration that we perceive on the moon. Now this libration is a bit more simple to understand geometrically. You see, as the moon is higher up from the point of view of us, we can see more of the bottom. And when the moon is more below our line of sight, we see more of the top. And so combining these two optical librations, we get the majority of the wobble that we perceive in the moon, allowing us to see around the top, the bottom, and the left and the right. The second type of libration is the parallax libration. So imagine you are fixed on the Earth's surface and you are observing the moon. From one point in the day to another point in the day, you rotate about the Earth's center and you are actually moved in space by a non-significant amount. Now this amount that you move lets you see a little bit around the left and the right sides of the moon. And this amount is quite small, uh, less than a degree that you can see around the sides of the moon, just from where you are on the earth and what time it is. So a pretty minor effect, but not one that we can ignore. Now the last component of the perceived wobble of the moon is the physical libration. Now this is the moon actually wobbling around on its own axis by itself. The pole to pole physical libration of the moon where it's librating up and down can be about a degree and a half in amplitude, 
while the side-to-side -side libration of the moon is quite a bit smaller at about 0 0.004 degrees of libration, which is pretty negligible as you can see in this animation. Now the physical libration of the moon is quite difficult to predict. There are some periods of physical libration that have been discovered, but the amplitude and how far it's going to move is very generally hard to predict on the moon. This is a pretty complex math problem. So these are the three main components of the perceived wobble of the moon that we see here as observers on Earth. Now, how are we actually going to capture this wobble? So this wobble is relatively slow. It takes some time to be able to see, and if we really want to capture the complete libration of the moon, Ideally, we want to do this for a whole lunar cycle, which spans about 28 days in length. So the plan is to go from full moon to full moon, capturing the moon every single day for about 28 days. From this, we should see the full libration as well as the full moon phase of the moon over the course of a lunar month. So the biggest challenge when it comes to capturing a full lunar cycle every single day is the weather it's pretty much impossible to find a place that is going to be perfectly clear for the entire duration of a lunar cycle. It's very rare, and this is the greatest challenge. But this is one that I am especially well equipped to deal with, and it also kind of informs why I use the telescope you see behind me for this challenge. So for capturing all these photos, I'm not going to just be in one place on Earth. I'm going to be in multiple places at once. This is because last year I sent out a remote observatory to Namibia, and I also have a remote observatory in Fresno, California. Now between these two locations, as well as my real physical location here in Utah, I will have pretty much guaranteed clear skies at least once per night, every given night of the lunar month. Of course, this does bring up some potential challenges in that I can't really normalize the images for the parallax libration effect. And this is because my observatory in Namibia is very, very far away. And the perceived libration between here and the United States could actually be you know, up to a degree of libration just from where we're observing on the Earth. And this is a non-negligible effect. It's not as significant as the optical libration effect, but it could end up being noticeable in the final time lapse. All right, with that out of the way, I think it's time we do a time lapse montage of the whole month. So doing this capturing challenge was a bit of a nightmare at first. You see, I started the challenge on the super blue moon of August, and this was a great high point to start the challenge off at. I drove up to Alta, Utah, a high elevation place, and I got a really beautiful shot of the moon, and it was great. The moods were high, but as the moon slowly started to get smaller, as we went through the waning phases of the moon, the challenge became more and more difficult. And that's because the moon moves throughout our sky over the course of a lunar month. Essentially, it does a full ring around our sky. Uh, the newest moon will be visible in the sunset sky 
and the waning moon is visible in the morning twilight sky. And this is the biggest part of the challenge is waking up for the waning phases of the moon. So the full moon essentially will rise at sunset. And as you work your way through the lunar cycle, the moon will move more and more in the direction east. So you'll be getting up later and later and later every single night just to get your photos. And this stage was by far the most difficult. I was waking up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. It was uh, a, a big challenge on me. I stopped, uh, <laughs> I even stopped filming some B-roll because I was starting to get really tired over the course of doing these specific capturing parts. Um, luckily though, there were a couple of cloudy nights here in Utah which saved my sleep cycle and I was able to do my moon images partially from Africa as well. And of course the time offset is plus nine hours for me. It was basically about pretty late in the day when I was actually doing my moon photos when it was cloudy here. But slowly we worked our way into the new moon phase, which was really great. The new moon is essentially when the moon is closest to the sun and it becomes impossible or difficult to capture a photo of the moon at all. Now you can actually photograph the moon during a perfect new moon, like a total solar eclipse or an annual solar eclipse. It's possible to photograph the moon in front of the sun. That is not happening right now. So for this moon phase, I didn't capture it. But slowly, once the moon works its way past this, it enters into the waxing phases, which is where the moon goes from being a thin sliver in the sunset sky to slowly growing and eventually became full again yesterday when I just finished this challenge. Now, what telescopes did I actually use to do this challenge and why? The main two scopes used for photographing the whole libration of the moon were my Orion 80 millimeter refractor here at home, along with my 85 millimeter Takahashi refractor in Namibia. Now, these two scopes are quite similar in performance and focal length, and so they were a good matchup for getting similar photos throughout the lunar cycle. This was most significant because my telescope in Namibia gets the clearest skies out of any observatory I have, so it was kind of the bedrock guaranteed I would get my moon photo, and it was essential that whatever I did here at home roughly matched what I got there in Namibia in order to guarantee a successful lunar cycle. Along with this, I used my Spencer's camera modified R5, which is just a simple full frame DSLR that paired nicely with the scope. And along with this, I used a 2X Barlow to get a little bit more zoom out of the moon. Now my system in Namibia is using a ZWO 6200mm monochrome camera, which is optimized for deep sky astrophotography. These two things mean the systems are pretty similar in terms of how they sample and what kind of image quality they both get which should pair up nicely for a finished animation. Now assembling together these images to produce the final moon image is quite difficult. Of course, going throughout all of these nights, I'm rotating my camera around on my telescope because I'm using my camera for other things. Not to mention this, the telescopes in Namibia and this one don't perfectly match in terms of their image scale. So these required some special detail in order to actually bring the images together in a way that was coherent to show the wobbling of the moon. Now, essentially how I did this is I started with the full moon. I loaded up all of my images into Photoshop and I slowly registered all of them as best as I could in order to get them to match up. Now these images were matched as closely as I could for scale and rotation. Of course, these images are in fact impossible to register completely because of the perceived vibration. So I simply sought a solution in the rotation between photos that minimized the difference between the images so that I could identify where the libration was the main component and what was causing the images to shift relative to each other. Now, apart from this, I can't actually show how the moon moves towards and away from us. You see, the moon is moving on an elliptical path. So for part of this lunar cycle, it's closer and for part of it, it's further away. Now, if I register all my images together in terms of scale, I can't actually show this effect meaningfully. However, I can simulate it accurately just by applying a simple sine wave to the scale of the image, one that relatively matches what we would see in experimental data. In this way, I can return the natural state of how the moon appears to move towards and away from us over the course of a lunar month showing the super moon and of course the mini moon. And altogether we get this animation as the final result.
So one of the big questions is why would I go through all the trouble to do this to myself? Part of it is uh, me and my girlfriend were walking around in a home goods store and I saw a print of the moon where they just showed all the different moon phases and I was like, I could probably do that myself and make it better. So part of this was to make a print of the moon, which you should be able to find in my website when this video goes live. That was part of my inspiration was the other inspiration is I wanted to show something unexpected or different and one of the easiest things to do in astrophotography, which is look at the moon. You can kind of make anything in this field of astronomy a challenge if you want to, even something as simple as photographing the moon. And I simply wanted to challenge myself and teach an interesting lesson in orbital mechanics and the physics of the moon. So with that, I hope you guys enjoy the video. Again, all the stuff you can find in the links in the description, and I will catch you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.